Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our Talks with Wald as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to passage 41 of Song of Myself. Now we have said in earlier lectures that sections 39 to 41 are Whitman as divine, as, as the poet, as the shaman, and we're going to see him as well here as the integralist. Now, of course, integral psychology and philosophy is a concept that we in 303 like to talk about. Ken Wilber has argued that no human mind is capable of 100% error, and from that premise, we then will look at Whitman as being, uh, and we've mentioned already that the word integral actually gets used in Leaves of Lisa Grass, um, but our key line comes, of course, from Passage 4, both in and out of the game and watching and wondering at it. I witness and wait. And we're going to obviously pay attention to the way that line becomes significant in Passage 41 as well. Now, Whitman, it seems, becomes increasingly more and more iconoclastic as he moves towards the 52nd uh, uh, second passage of Song of Myself. We're going to see how iconoclastic, in fact, he is. It's often the case that when I will say to students, you know, in 1855, when Leaves of Grass was published, there were lots of people who were so offended that one guy threw it in the fire, and they assume that it's because of the sexual stuff that's in Leaves of Grass. But interestingly, it's as much about a passage like Passage 41 of Song of Myself, where Whitman is going to say about all religions, remember what he says in Passage 1, creeds and schools and advance, what he'll say about all religions is at the same time challenging, fascinating, but also for readers of 55, especially 1855, horrifying. Now, the assumption is that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net. All uh, 24 poems of inscriptions have been covered. The 19 sections of Pomodoc, so important. Now, I'll just give you two examples. Uh, remember in passage 7 that he says, um, I, too, following many and followed by many, inaugurate a new religion. And you remember that he said in passage 10 that if he was going to reduce all of Leaves of Grass down to three greatnesses, it would be love, democracy, and the greatness of religion. So with that in mind, we're going to pick up uh, the, you know, now with Song of Myself. My assumption is that you've been following our stuff, especially from that intro lecture of Song of Myself, all the way through uh, passage 40. And now we're going to pick up with Whitman. Some have seen this as Whitman's protestation of the prophet of a new religion. And it is true that between this passage and 48, those two passages, we're going to get basically Whitman's idea of what, what he sees as, as religion. The language is at times here going to be very mystical, samadhi-like, I mean, if to speak in mystical language and enlightening. Now, because the passage is a little bit long, I'm not going to read it in its entirety, and I wish that I could, but I'm, I'm going to go right to address right away specific lines. He begins, I am he bringing help for the sick as they pant on their backs. In other words, this almost like Christ-like figure who is able to resuscitate, or a physician-like figure for the sick. Notice the use of the word pant on their backs. It's a compelling image, right? Now, Whitman himself saw quite a bit of this because he was a nurse during the Civil War, and so we'll, we'll pay attention to that. And he says, I'm not only for the weak and for the helpless panting on their back, and for strong, upright men, I bring yet more needed help. That is to say, um, we all need help, according to Whitman. I heard was said of the universe, and there obviously we have the echo of that. I mean, when you start reading by the end, the last, the last 12 sections of Song of Myself are designed, I think, intentionally to make you go, wait a minute, didn't we hear something kind of like that? We've called these, those echoes. I heard what was said of the universe, now this has to do less with science and more with religion, heard it and heard it of several thousand years. He loves that thousand years right thing because 2,000 years prior is the birth of Christ. It is middling well as far as it goes, a very American term, middling well as far as it goes, but is that all his rhetorical question? In other words, is the religion and are the religions of the past enough for this new modern rendering of democracy. Whitman will say only middling well. In other words, there's parts of them. Uh, this is his fallibilist position epistemologically in our big five as we commented in the intro lecture, right? I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. And now he's going to begin to critique these religions, right? He will then play the game of magnifying and applying 
come I. Now, of course, the use of the word come, we've pointed out the very first word in the epigraph of the deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass. I told you so. All the way through Leaves of Grass, we're going to be playing the game with the word come. Notice the syntax here. He could have said, I come magnifying and applying, but he doesn't. Also, notice all of the words in this poem that end in ing. And you'll begin to get a sense that it's very intentional. Out bidding at the start the old cautious hucksters. Now it's here that of course uh, many people will see that he's, you know, this is, kind of, this is kind of a bit mean by virtue of the fact that he's going to call religious priests and prophets and advocates of religion the old cautious hucksters. Now the use of the word hucksters is an interesting word. Is that they're selling something, right? Okay. And then there is a missing line that was edited out after the American Civil War. I'll let you decide why. The most they offer for mankind and eternity, less than a spirit of my own seminal wet. So in other words, he will play the game of saying that my own semen is of greater value than all the religions have ever offered to mankind, to humankind. Now obviously that's just I mean, that's as radical a line, I mean, you can't even imagine somebody like Chaucer writing a line like that, although he probably would have laughed if he could have read it. That line was edited out. I'll leave to you to decide maybe why. We'll ask more of those questions, uh, you know, at the end of our discussion. Taking myself, he says, the exact dimensions of, and now he uses the word Jehovah. Um, in the 55, he even goes one step further, and laying them away, which he edited out finally. In other words, are we getting rid of all prior religions? I can't tell you how radically iconoclastic language like this was in 55. Um, and then we'll get an interesting um, kind of listing of great religious traditions. Lithographing Kronos, Zeus is his son, and Hercules, his grandson, by drafts of Osiris, Isis, Belus, uh, Brahma, Buddha, it, it was actually Adonai in the 55 and not Buddha. He changed it from Adonai to Buddha for reasons that I'll let you speculate on. In my portfolio, placing Manito loose, Allah on a leaf, the crucifix engraved with Odin and the hideous faced Mexvili, and every idol and image, taking them all for what they are worth, and not a cent more. Admitting they were alive and did the work of their days, they bore mites, as for unfledged birds, who have now to rise and fly and sing for themselves. Wow. Accepting the rough deific sketches to fill out better in myself, bestowing them freely on each man and woman I see, discovering as much or more, and then he goes into this interesting list of all of the different work or occupations that will become the new religion of America. Now our, uh, our um, notes here will help us a little bit in referencing some of the stuff we just read. Uh, notice Kronos, of course, the titan son of Uranus and Gaia, who dethroned his father and was turn, in turn dethroned obviously by his son Zeus. Osiris, the Egyptian god of the lower world. Isis, the Egyptian goddess of fertility, sister and wife of Osiris. Belus was the legendary king of Assyria. Manito is the nature spirit of the Algonquin Indians. Mexilites, uh, the Aztec god of war. Brahma, in Hindu religion, the supreme soul of the universe. Odin, in Norse mythology, the god of war. So obviously here we are, we're playing around, right? We're listing um, several major religions and artifacts of those religions. And about all of those, he says, taking them all for what they are worth and not a cent more. In other words, he wants to value religion but not give too much credence to it. It's a very radical idea, especially in 1855. Admitting they, notice the tenses, they were alive and did the work of their days. They bore mites as for unfledged birds who have now to rise and fly and sing for themselves. Whitman believed that religion played an important role in American history, but that America would outgrow its old religious traditions with what he calls, and starting from Pominach 7, inaugurating a new religion. Right? Then again, noticing all these ING words, accepting the rough, deific sketches to fill out better 
in myself, interesting that the poem is called Song of Myself, bestowing them freely on each man and woman I see. Notice, not a huckster, not trying to sell something, I'm giving this information, bestowing it freely. Discovering as much, notice the, or more line, in a framer framing a house. Now all of a sudden we're going to move from religion to occupational work. I hear America singing comes to mind. And now we're just going to get a series of these images of all the people who are doing work. And for Whitman, this is an example of the true religion, of the new religion, the modern religion of America. Putting higher claims for him there with his rolled up sleeves driving him out at the chisel. Somebody working there as higher claims on religious truth, not objecting to special relation, revelations, considering a curl of smoke or the hair on the back of my hand just as curious as any revelation. I mean, it what an iconoclastic line. And again, notice the use of the word hair. Lads, a hold of fire engines and hook and ladder ropes, no less to me than the gods of the antique wars. And we immediately think, of course, of the Iliad or the Aeneid. Minding their voices, we've heard a lot about voices, haven't we, in Lisa Grass? Peel through the crash of destruction. He's making references, obviously, to all different kinds of religions here as he's playing this game. Their brawny limbs passing safe over charred legs, their white foreheads whole and unhurt out of the flames. It's almost as if they're the new Hephaestus, right? By the mechanic's wife. Now we're going to rework the, the, uh, the Mary um, um, story. By the mechanic's wife with her babe and her nipple interceding for every person born. Again, this was radical stuff for its day. Then notice we'll have our trinity. Only instead of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, we have the three sites at harvest. Whizzing in a row from three lusty angels with shirts bagged out at their waists. Again, notice the reference to waists. The stag tooth holster. And, and, and as I said to you, it's fascinating the way that Whitman goes from the general to the very, very specific and makes you wonder, did he have somebody in his own biography playing uh, you know, around with this, right? The holster, the person who takes care of ponies at a, at a, at a hotel, a very, a very low kind of position. The snag tooth holster with red hair, redeeming sins past and to come. Very Christ-like kind of figure, the new Christ, right? Selling all he possesses, sounding much like the Mark 10, 17 to 27 story. Traveling on foot to fee lawyers for his brother and set by him while he is tried for uh, forgery. It almost sounds like he's re reinventing this notion of the, of the Good Samaritan story, right? What was strewn in the amplest strewing, the square rod about me, and not filling the square rod then. In other words, I have enough theology, he says, right here in my own, uh, my own neck of the woods. And then he uses this uh, interesting phrase, the bull and the bug never worshipped half enough. Dung and dirt are more admirable than was drained. Now, we'll come back to notes here with Norton to hear about this bull and the bug thing. And we'll read the bull and the bug probably chosen as common objects that the bull was worshipped in Greece as the embodiment of Dionysius, as we've spoken of in other lectures, and also held sacred by the Egyptians and believed by the Muslims to support the earth on its back. The uh, Scabarus, the dung beetle, was the model for icons of the Egyptian sun god Kephra. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing thing, the way that Whitman will play this game, right, where he's joining all these religions together. By the way, just to go back to that list one more time, Osiris, Isis, Belus, Brahma mentioned, of course, the Buddha, as opposed to Adonai in the 55 edition. Um, and then also notice Allah on a leaf. Interesting that it, the book is called Leaves of Grass. If, of course, we know anything about the creation of the Holy Quran, we know about the idea that it, those words were written on leaves. So it's fascinating the way that Whitman is playing this game. And about all of this, he's going to reduce everything down to dung and dirt, which is kind of a fascinating way. Because we're going to end Song of Myself with dirt under his boot soles. The supernatural of no account, myself waiting my time to be one of the Supremes. And again, that I, I, I witness and wait, right, from passage four. Waiting my time to be one of the Supremes. It's as if Whitman himself is ready to postulate that I'm going to be considered the new founder of a new religion that will bring all the old religions to its ultimate fruition and beyond it, transcendent included. Fascinating. 
the day getting ready for me when I shall do as much good as the best and be as prodigious. And then we have one more final line missing that was edited out. It reads like this, guessing when I am it will not tickle me much to receive puffs out of pulpit or print. Read it again. Guessing when I am. That, and of course, that construction of I am, we've, set, we've talked about already from Exodus 3, right? Guessing when I am it will not tickle me much to receive puffs out of pulpit or print. In other words, when it happens, I will be shocked that I will have been the inventor of this new religious theological voice. And then he says it. My life lumps, exclamation point, becoming already a creator. In the 55 edition, there was a second exclamation point. So we're back possibly to Seaman reference. Of course, the line that was edited out, and again, edited out after the Civil War, maybe just considered to be too extreme. But now notice my life lumps. Now, life lumps is interesting. could be read a number of ways, right? One can obviously be all the rough stuff, the theodicy question, all the rough stuff that's happened in my life, my life lumps. It can also obviously mean his, his idea of semen. And then I, as I said to you, he was very influenced by this idea of one of the Egyptian cosmogonic stories that the gods had in fact ejaculated all of existence all, uh, uh, as uh, creation as being nothing more than just a large act of masturbation. And for Whitman, that was an idea that he resonated with and he played around with it all the way through Lisa Grass, certainly in Song of Myself. Becoming already a creator, and of course Whitman is a creator in Leaves of Grass, putting myself here and now to the ambushed womb of the shadows. Now, what is this ambushed womb all about? Well, some readers have seen this, of course, as the very idea of the virgin birth itself. And then what's up with the shadows? That is to say, of the unknown. In other words, leaves of grass is born of the unknown, and yet he says these poems are the product that will bring together all of the religious traditions of the world into a new kind of understanding that, for lack of a better phrase, we'll simply call integral. Well, what are we going to do with lines like this? Again, as I'm trying to, I'm trying to influence on you guys just how radical an idea this was. Well, we've got Whitman obviously as the new radical, uh, integral religion, right? A, a, a religionist of an American religion, as maybe he'll call. At two B, note again the missed lines, uh, the the edited lines, and why they're edited out. I'll leave up to you. Uh, notice as well all of his listing with all those gods as if somehow um, we're going to know all of those, right? He will do that game. I think, I think uh, T.S. Eliot learned, and we see it in, in uh, Wasteland. We've given full lectures on Wasteland. But I think that you'll, you'll see something similar in that kind of thing where you just mention things and you just kind of assume that people are going to know what we're talking about with Osiris, for example. At 3A, well, the mentioning of the Buddha being taken out by the deathbed edition and uh, Adonai being taken out and the Buddha being being put there immediately makes us reference Thoreau and Emerson, contemporary thinkers who were very, very influenced by uh, the the religions of often the, the East as, we're, as we'll refer to them. Uh, you'll remember that in fact Emerson, in our lectures on Emerson, we commented on this, Emerson wrote poems about Brahman. He would mention uh, ideas that came from the Bhagavad Gita. Of course, we know that Thoreau took the Bhagavad Gita with him to Walden itself. We've commented on that elsewhere. The, the, that we're speaking about the integral um, ideas. Obviously, we'll mention Ken Wilber's Marriage of Sense and Soul or his integral spirituality. I also want to mention here Houston Smith and that non-apologetic approach to religion. Again, we've commented in 303. You can talk about religion from two perspectives, an apologetic and non-apologetic approach. The apologetic approach is to argue about what's right or what's wrong about the religion, right? A non-apologetic approach in Ken Wilber's Religions of the World, is for us our classic example of this, is simply to talk about all those different religions so that you can have an understanding of them. In other words, you don't read the chapter on Buddhism to become a Buddhist, you read the chapter on Buddhism so that you can know what Buddhists actually believe. We'll recommend that book as well to you. Finally, in 3b, what are your thoughts about this notion of combining religions or reducing religions down to common ideas? Do you believe this kind of thing can and should be done, or do you think that's kind of dangerous? And then what's your own view about the value of religion, especially increasingly in a more sectarian world, a world in which fewer and fewer people believe necessarily in religion? What are your thoughts about the value of religion in your own life? Well, we'll finish again this small section, as we said, of 39 to 41, uh, with some radical and iconoclastic language that I'll leave to you. I hope you're being challenged. Thank you.